Hello everyone, today we talk about Ilkhanid Heavy Cavalry. So, a very specific topic, realize, and I will try to give a bit of background, given that I think I've never spoken specifically... Oh, well, yeah, I made a, a video on the first Mongol conquests, but I never actually went pretty thoroughly into, especially the Mongol conquests and the, let's say, um, various Mongol uh, powers, or at least the ones that um, originated from uh, eventually the fragmentation of the Mongol Empire, because this is what I the Il Ilkhanate practically, practically is. It was a Mongol um, Khanate was established in Iran in the 13th century, and that was considered, in fact, part of, of the same Mongol Empire. Um, <coughs> the um, and the uh, the history is very fascinating given the uh, setting and especially the relation between the Mongols and the local populations, like for other Khanates, uh, <coughs> that uh, into which eventually the, the Mongol Empire has split. So this was a huge area, this encompassed a huge area actually of uh, the uh, near and, uh, and especially the Middle East. So mm, uh, the the center was Iran. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the uh, the in this sense was the continuation of the previous rules of the Seljuks or the Khwarezmians. I mean this um, um, let's say uh, harbor you can say we or I don't know central power how you want to define it represented by Persia that uh, albeit um, you know having been conquered by the Arabs in the sixth excuse me in the seventh century and having um, passed under various domination kind of always remained sort of uh, of entity on its own, uh, eventually absorbing all the various rulers from uh, that ruled from, from, from this very um, advantageous strategic position given by the Iranian plateau and uh, from which they could eventually expand into various directions. In fact, um, some of the richest territories of the world this time were also the ones of uh, Iraq that were also ruled by the Ilkhanate, uh, parts of northern Syria. Even here the, the borders were kind of fluctuating and they mostly this dominion was relatively um, light. Um, the, the, there were especially a lot of clashes against the Mamluks at this point between the, um, you know, uh, of the Ilkhanids between Mamluks but also expanded on uh, wide areas of Afghanistan and Turkmenistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey and Western Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the Ilkhanate, as we were saying before, were practically um, the, uh, the was based on this conquest uh, of this early Mongol conquest of the uh, Khwarezmian Empire in between the years 1219 and 1224 and was founded as such by uh, Genghis Khan's nephew Hulagu Khan. Mm -hmm. um, so in here uh, I'm giving a bit of background because uh, I believe it's too fascinating not to give. Naturally today we will stick mostly to uh, what the Ilkhanate army and especially, especially heavy cavalry really really was, so given that there are many, um, there, there are not ma ex a huge amount of, f of sources, it's weird how actually even about Mongols, we sometimes we know more about, fro at least from the western perspective, from vers uh, western historiography and sources than actually the, the same uh, evidence we can find there. So a very precious um, source for the Ilkhanate is actually the um, historian uh, Rashid Ald, uh, Aldin uh, Hamadani. Mm. Um, the, um, this uh, historian is extremely uh, important because he was essentially uh, also functionary and uh, a magician uh, uh, in uh, uh, at the um, and he actually became vizier of the. Um, Ghazan Khan, that was uh, the uh, I think I think his seventh Ilkhanate ruler, and the one who converted um, the the ruling dynasty, Mongol dynasty, from the uh, from Buddhism to Islam, essentially. And uh, Rashid was a Persian, actually of Jewish heritage, and he, um, as many others, uh, at the time when um, in this Ilkhanate, when uh, the the dynasty actually accept made of Islam a religion of, of, of the dominion and 
also um, um, the Christians and the Jews uh, and other um, minorities had uh, basically their uh, rights, uh, parts of the ra uh, the rights revoked. Um, Islam became kind of sort of the uh, necessary religion for any also men at court. So uh, Rashid converted to Islam, and um, his um, his um, um, work uh, as a historian, especially, is extremely important because he produced this chronicle known as Yami al Tabarik, that would be uh, literally the you know the the set the the, the ensemble of his of stories practically that is um, actually the most important work of um, of the Khanid period mm, in the area, and he. Um, uh, he uh, Rashid actually had a very sad story because eventually he was accused of having attempted to the life of the Ilkhan Oliyatu, and he was eventually uh, um, killed. Uh, ex he was executed in 1318. But his um, work um, uh, was um, extremely successful, and it contained essentially a. I mean, initially had to be a, a history of the Mongols mm, and of their dynasties, but eventually it, it extended um, in many parts of history since the creation, actually, um, and from uh, times of uh, the time of Adam, actually. So he is, um, um, uh, let's say that, and also in here he um, worked in close contact with uh, Bolad, who was a Mongolian. Uh, uh, emissary of the actually of the great Khan uh, uh, in the at the Ilkhanic court that uh, told to him a lot actually about the past of the Mongols and um, and helped him hi in this work. Um, so the the one of the most important thing about the uh, Yami al Tawarik as a work is that um, it, it was um, a work executed realized. Um, at the um, extremely refined scriptorium uh, um, of uh, Rab e uh, Rashidi in Tabriz, hmm? at the time was one of the most important centers also in, in the Ilkhanid, an extremely important international trade center actually. And <coughs> this place was a, um, an extremely uh, advanced school of calligraphists and of um, enlighters that um, produced these extremely rich codes. Uh, with beautiful mm, depictions um, of of the stories that are narrated, um, and that offer us uh, an extraordinary iconographical uh, source, mm. they provide us with these beautiful pictures, especially talking about war, as you can imagine, the Mongols being pretty warlike um, <coughs> people, um, historically speaking, having conquered the world practically at the time. So. We are lucky enough to get from these iconographic sources uh, lots of information about the, especially this late um, time of Mongol equipment and so on. As in the 14th century, eventually, the uh, the mid of 14th century, the the Mongol Empire fragmented into the several regional chunks that, uh, in fact, revolved around these pre-existent centers of of, of power uh, in um <coughs> all over uh, Eurasia. Um, so we're looking at a later stage, actually, of the Mongolian um, armies, and, and this is interesting because while I were re reading this for preparing the video, I realized that, um, in fact, the um, Ilkhanid army had very strong characteristics uh, derived from actually the local armies, not just from the Mongol ones. As we will see, the Mongol ones will have um, a substantial impact also on Persian. Um, uh, on Persian military culture and equipment, um, in the in different ways, also because the actually the, the Iranian world is is huge, so and dif in uh, different places in different way in measures and ways, um, um, but it, it, it's it's really perhaps more the the other way around. I mean, it's really at, at this point the um, the the absorption of Persian elements into the uh, Ilkhanate than the rather the 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 opposite and in fact uh, the same fragmentation of the Mongol Empire started because of these phenomena and the same Ilkhanate uh, would practically disintegrate into this series of um, smaller um, principalities and um, that were typical of um, 
Iran at the time as feudal as a feudal land. It obviously had also statal um, organization, telling the truth. But that, um, however, was based on you know nepotism, these clientels, and um, therefore that attempt of centralization practically practically vanished. And this m meant that the um, uh, the local ruling dynasty obviously uh, at a certain point finished in 1335 and <coughs> what we have is essentially Persia now with some Mongol influences of Central Asian influences excuse me I drink a little bit so <coughs> just to tell this in a nutshell hmm, even the <coughs> naturally the conversion to Islam from Buddhism and this um, was a process uh, requi required in order to govern these extremely, um <coughs> di um, you know, vast lands that had a um, um, obviously a progressed Muslim population that wasn't happy about the initial, you know, um, you know, the Mongols were pretty, um, pretty open religiously speaking at this time as all coming from this, this kind of animistic uh, background that uh, was very mm, uh, initially favored pretty much uh, the uh, the acceptance of many different religions the same actually the same mm, uh, Mongolia was mm, new uh, Christianism, Judaism uh, and and Islam before expanding to the rest of Eurasia it was pretty interconnected. So the Mongols had been used to have several different religions, even at their court, even the same members of their 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 court and women, the princesses they married from other populations. And when they conquered um, <coughs> this almost all all of uh <coughs> the all of Asia parts of Europe, they kind of accepted every uh, creed. Uh, then eventually they were, uh, in fact, Ilkhanid Persia initially was a pretty tolerant uh, place where also N Nestorianism, um, other forms of Christianity, Judaism coexisted with Islam. And the Mongols, in this sense, tried to, to flatten the, the Islamic um <coughs> power into, into uh, initially into Persia by saying essentially everybody should be allowed to do it. And th there were also very pragmatic reasons for, for doing this because naturally um, at this time um, there were very important uh, presences also of um, of different um, different communities coming from, from the most di diverse uh, lands. Um <coughs> some of them being uh also italians uh byzantines um at this point you know that uh, the the mongol invasion had also opened the trade routes in 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 in, in intercontinentally in the sense that having unified this enormous area of eurasia they um the mongols were interested in in trade to to flow to make it mm, pass from between uh, Europe and China without um, other, say, blocks in in the middle. Um, so uh, there was a, a great expansion also of cultural expansion at this time, especially the Italian merchants from Europe went to China, went to the Mongol courts. Um, and this is actually pre pretty famous as a um, as a phenomenon, and it was a, a great moment of uh, interest from um, for, for the Europeans towards this uh, conquerors that, albeit had invaded Europe themselves, definitely uh, ended up uh, at the end of the Mongol expansion also to become allies. Mm. For instance, the Christians at this time, given the relative flu uh, religious fluidity of the Mongol world, had hoped that, especially the Ilkhanate, that was the closest one and the less, uh, the least, um, say, conflictual one, differently from the one that uh, the, the Golden Horde had been established into Russia was potentially a threat also to um, to Christians. Um, they they hoped this powers would convert to to Christianity mm. and they would help um, the uh, the Europeans essentially fighting against the the Muslims in the 
uh, in the in the Holy Land, or w what remained uh, naturally of the uh, Outremer states at this point. Um, then eventually the whole thing failed, the and when the Mongol Empire collapsed once again, uh, it's not that these relations stopped because actually even if you look when from the r with the rise of the Ottoman Empire, the the, the Christian the Western Europeans tried uh, constantly to you know to 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 remain in touch with Persia and trying to make. Um, a joint operations against the Turks and so on. So th this horizons more or less remained. But at that point, the um, the political unity of Eurasia under the Mongol um, domination had ceased. So there were basically um, there were these other powers that were all kind of conflicting against each other. The traffics had, in a sense, contracted because every single power wanted to make money out of the Silk Road. So putting tolls and exa exacting. Um, so the, the there was a contraction uh, towards, uh, in fact, from the 14th century onwards, that was dictated also by other reasons, chiefly also the Black Death, uh, this broader economical contractions that brought the Europeans to kind of keep to to lose track of, of uh, at least of, of most of what they had been seen before. Um, and this is interesting because we actually know there were communities of Europeans into Mongol China, for instance. Uh, um, and that were works of translation and so on. And I don't know why I'm talking about this on a video that is um, based on on um, military history. Uh, it's about military history, but um, th I think these details are important because they also give you the, the background of what these powers really were about. Because uh, the more you study military history, the more the more you you realize um, there is um, a great uh, need for. Um, say to to look at these systems not as something close or something you know um stereotypical as you'd say i don't know today we talk about ilkhanic cavalry uh, cavalry this was as if you know, as if this was something radically different from other cavalries that existed at the time no um it was the result of a process of several cultures uh, blending together and re um, sh uh, finding what this thing so in fact i now i tendentially make um these videos are themed on you know specific kind of fighters in history and giving them a bit of and of of characterization let's say and this is obviously a need for you know setting more or less clearly time uh, and space uh, and r giving a dimension of more or less in fact this broader cultural elements rather than the strip military aspect in here um, and it's also important to understand that the mm, this kind of classification of categorization how you want to call it um, is actually pretty risky also uh, in many ways and we mostly talk about processes of tendencies of transformations in here also in the, in the defining styles also because by the way we don't know excessively much as I was saying before um, were not extremely well documented about the same Mongols, the Mongol Empire, Mongol military that is been this um, extraordinary uh, event in medieval history, having created what uh, up to that point had been the the, la the largest uh, empire in the world, ex extensionally speaking, um <coughs> is uh, is that we don't know objectively much about how these guys fought, how they especially their from their own perspective, because these were initially especially populations that came from in fact from from these nowhere land <laughs> that um didn't see you know, the usage of of, uh, of writing for instance they didn't record that much so even uh, about the mongol conquest we have many as for other great times in history uh, of um, you know for our great empires in history when they were rising we don't have an enormous amount of information after all we don't know so much about the early Macedonians for instance we don't know much even about the early Romans if you think about it so in the case of the Mongols this is even more this is even bigger because these were actually nomadic populations of Central Asia at a certain point expanded because in virtue of reasons that now we, we, we don't have time to explain but that um, entered immediately into contact with ex much more developed civilizations. And this is a moment in history in which indeed some of the greatest and um, things can be achieved. Because uh, I, the more I uh, 
look at history in general, uh, the more I realize that the more primitive peoples are actually some of the most open-minded that exist. So actually the greatness of the Mongols has been achieved not just thanks to their pre uh, pregressed, let's say, uh, political and social organization, definitely was also produced this extraordinary military machine, but uh, actually their <laughs> conquest, the, the creation of their, their own empire, would have not been feasible if they had not been so open and eager to absorb the um, the knowledge, the know-how, the technology, the, the culture broadly meant, the civilization of empires like the one in fact of, of China, even of Persia like in this case, and really taking the very best of everyone and showing the ability of being able to, to make a synthesis, of uh, an original synthesis out of that. Mm. The, uh, the Mongols could have not um, uh, taken, you know, some of the greatest, um, most populated and, and fortified areas of the world at this time, if they're not absorbed um, uh, pr prof uh, proficiently um, uh, Chinese military, uh, successfully in uh, Chinese mili uh, siege uh, technology, for instance, um, and having especially if um, successfully um, integrated this in in a military say the military doctrine, a bit anachronistically, but in the practice that's what it is. Um, so what I was mostly surprised by, in fact, is, and, and I, I didn't finish, uh, what I w the point I was making is that eventually we start knowing through the sources, these populations, actually from the sources of the conquered peoples, not from the Mongols themselves. Naturally, as we have seen also we here with uh, Rashid uh, al-Din uh, Amadani, here there was a contact with you know a communication and exchange sharing of uh, uh, of knowledge of uh, of um, of history also of the mongol past between the uh, mongols and the here the, the persians um so that eventually we started knowing also about that past because there was finally someone who put it who wrote it down um but still um, it's a bit. It's all a bit foggy, complex. Well, even the same uh, Rashid work is um, an extraordinary chronicle that tells us so much about so th the most diverse, um, uh, you know, mm, uh, stories of uh, not just of the Mongol Empire but also other powers, their interaction, and so on. But sometimes these informations are all also um, scanny, relatively to a single. Um, a uh, single topic, they 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 are sometimes just superficial or, however, unreliable. Um, I'm not saying that this is a bad work. Also, historically speaking, uh, it is actually amazing. It's just that the uh, at this point the the historical accuracy was not even a uh, was not a top priority. Huh? These works were created also for certain political reasons for certain. Um, propagandistic reasons as well. So um, we have to read them carefully, but in the case of um, looking at Ilkhanid cavalry, so essentially the this uh, the cavalry, this Mongol um, Persian um, uh, armies, we look at those manuscripts and really see a lot of interesting things. Uh, especially um, <laughs> considering that, so I, I didn't explain what Ilkhanid means. Well, if, as far as I understood, Ilkhanid means um, Ill would be inf a root word for saying inferior, S um, a prefix, sorry, for saying kind of smaller. Mm. And and canate, obviously, was the canate, so the, the, uh, the basically would be a lordship. It's uh, literally the, the territory over which uh, a can rules. Mm. And uh, this was, um, in fact, uh, the being there a great Khan, you know, the, the Mongols had this very structured and ordered uh, hierarchical uh, system also in the army, the, the decimal base, so everything had uh, also there were many um, similarities with the concept, the also the religious conception of, you know, the, the, the celestial deity that from which everything derived essentially, so uh, the idea of, of a divine hierarchy was in here was pretty present in the actual political practice. Um, so whatever, these are not excessively important 
things for today's topic, but they are still useful to make us understand a lot, a lot. And the the first thing, as I was saying, um, is when you look at the armor in the uh, Rashid al Din's manuscripts, is that this m Mongol, uh, this Ilkhanid heavy cavalry, say better, because they weren't uh, even the majority uh, of them Mongol anymore. Excuse me, I drink once again. Um, <coughs> is that these cavalrymen are much heavier than the Mongol average. Mm -hmm. So uh, the armor that is um, uh, depicted <coughs> in these um, um, scenes, in this um, 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 uh, miniatures, illuminations, um, is actually typical of the late 13th century sources. Mm -hmm. So what you see here is essentially long lamellar, lamellar corselets, mm -hmm. um, which were a typical um, armor of the steps in general, but they weren't excessively um, present uh, in the early Mongol armies. This is kind of a heavier um, form of armor that you find, especially, I believe, mm, the the closer uh, the closer the step arrived to the to the outskirts of the sanitary world of these big empires and and so on. So this kind of lamellar armor was definitely designed chiefly and had developed, especially in the step, for in the, in the surrounding uh, territories in order to cope with arrow fire. Mm -hmm. Lamellar armor uh, is best suited for, for that, essentially. It's also the most uh, expensive at this time, so it's uh, that's also a reason. And this um, armor was worn, usually, together with other uh, complements, chiefly a sort of uh, gambeson underneath, but also um, other um, embroidered uh, surcoats mm -hmm. that could be worn either beneath the armor and also over the armor. This is a practice that actually hap was known also in the West, for instance the Byzantines made uh, extensive use of such um, um, uh, surcoats, what we can say. And these were particularly uh, important because uh, from one side they give you, uh, obviously the the surcoat can never be as effective as the hard lamellar armor, right? But um, it's actually ca it can can be very uh, much more useful than than one might might think. The um <coughs> the uh, the early sources about the Mongols actually um, tell us that. Uh, the uh, th this Asian population uh, used to to wear um, um, this silks, um, rich brocades and cottons that were uh, important or, or simply pr produced at that point in in China or in Persia, mm -hmm. and the uh, so he mm, also purple baldkin and uh, this kind of. Um <coughs> Marco Polo speaks of uh, cloth of gold, even a brocade and silk, um, and uh, this went actually also for lighter cavalry men, mm -hmm. um, and many type actually of, of hides of skins. Sometimes um, the um, of mm, airmen, squirrel, fox, and fur. So this pertain actually to to the world of of the steppe, where these animals were pretty common. Then eventually, when the Mongols begin to settle down into this. Um, especially now in the Ilkhanate, um, their Ilkhanate, they start to access a, uh, a richer and more, um, especially as conquerors, they could, uh, of these very developed lands, could draw very consistent resources um, and abandoning their kind of more primitive lifestyle in le more, um, let's say, um, 
um, I don't know how to even say that, but um, let's say needy or poor um, uh, necessities, practically, and, and traditions that they had had. And what is uh, interesting is that um, the, the there was a type of Chinese uh, shirt that is first recorded at the beginning of the 13th century. It was made up of raw silk, mm, s worn um, as essentially as a type of armor. And silk I also in here was uh, had been mm, spread also in, in the West in this sense as a uh, as a material for 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 armor because silk has extremely um, uh, mm, uh, peculiar physical characteristics for which it's also used today into um, uh, bulletproof um, uh, jackets, for instance. Um, um, bulletproof armor because it really stops um, um, I I its fibers are um, structured in a fashion that they are extremely able to, to disperse the the in the uh, cinetic energy that comes from bullets all around um, and, and therefore uh, having uh, a less impact underneath the the um, the same uh, tissue so the the interesting thing about this is obviously these were relatively poor technologies, but the, the important thing here is that this silk, however, al when worn, even without armor, because this is witnessed also for light um, Mongol um, Mongol light cavalry men, um, the the arrows could actually penetrate your skin into uh, the um, when they arrived, uh, they they hit you, but they wouldn't made it. To, to pierce through the silk, so basically you would be penetrated by the the same silk with with the arrow uh, em enveloped in, and this was very important because although you could get wounded in this sense, and the silk um, had however absorbed part of the energy, and so also having prevented the the arrow had to 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 penetrate deeper, um, the the wound basically remained clean. Because it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't the, the the arrow wasn't arriving straight into the flesh. It was uh, enveloped by the silk. So the silk was overflowing. By the way, uh, arrows could be poisoned, could be, you know, d and but especially um, the if the wound um, had been in contact with open air, it could have been infected more easily because of the of the. Uh, bacteria that could enter into it. In fact, the main uh, thing at uh, this time was, uh, aside from the fact that most of the people died from v from infections rather than actually being killed uh, by, the, you know, by the sheer trauma during, or, you know, uh, hemorrhage during during the the, the combat. Um, the, the idea was, you know, creating these horrendous wounds for which there were also very um, spiked, uh, very per peculiar spiked and barbed uh, arrow heads, especially at a closer range, for closer range uh, uh, shooting, um, that had the objective of basically creating a, a disaster wound that was all you know um, pretty pretty messy and that couldn't be closed easily, so that basically the the bacteria could pour in and could be infected more easily. So just wearing this leather, uh, this s a raw silk jacket, so something also relatively, not so relatively uh, cheap because it wasn't it was raw, it wasn't worked, it wasn't a luxury product. Um, you could also be very, um, very well protected. So you can imagine this in a in a in a in a warfare like the one of the Mongols having such a mm, such a protection was really really pretty useful to the the uh, the um, now we'll see now that the Mongols used also extensively mostly hides um, and skins and leather um, as um, as armor because actually um, yeah th there were also metal plates and other uh, especially when the Mongols began to fight against uh, other enemies uh, in the, the, the Near East or even in Europe they began to, to essentially to collect the the armor of, of the fallen enemies as well that were usually also in uh, heavier in, in, in metal and so on but the, the Mongols didn't make an, a, a huge um, 
uh, quantitatively with the huge um, uh, use of um, of metal armor. Mm. The the uh, heavy the Mongol heavy cavalrymen of the the early Mongol era, let's say, was um, was actually pretty light, mm, and only the there was a very there was a mm, just a mm, a very elite, even numerically speaking, of, of the army was equipped with something heavier. Mm. There were some mm, we don't know excessively much. In fact, we, we know paradoxically more details about this lighter. Um, uh, how the, the Mongols were actually um, what they were wearing in clothes th rather than in armor, mm. and uh, this is partly also because the Mongol armies were largely unarmored because the majority of them were uh, were made up by, I mean the the they were made up by, by the large majority of of light cavalrymen of horse archers that you know uh, re relied on speed and. Um, on agility, so they even didn't need practically they uh, a lot of armor, a lot of protection because that could, you know, hamper their effectiveness in that sense, in that specific tactical role. Um, and and uh, all these European mm, authors that comment on Mongol equipment are pretty much interested about this broader outlook that the Mongols had, but uh, they don't. Um, although we have some consistent amount of, of information um, about the, Mo uh, the Mongol armor this uh, this is pretty still vague in in nature in in in, uh, in actual in explaining what this um, armor practically was so going back to the silk that was extremely efficient because in a warfare dominated by arrow fire you uh, you the the uh, the fighters will adapt to find it even most refined, but actually the most pragmatical, as always, solutions in order to um, to reduce, to, to minimize the effects of, uh, of arrow fire uh, as a protection. And, and silk was extremely effective in this sense, and it was kept being worn uh, also in this later stage, uh, here we are at the end of the 13th century, um, both over and underneath the armor, and this could really give a, a great um, edge because um, arrows do not arrive all, you know, mm, you know, at, at a at a ninety degrees uh, angle. Uh, they don't arrive all at the same, uh, you know, at the maximum of their, uh, you know, of their cinetic energy uh, in. The, uh, they 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 can all th you know there are many uh, poor shots the bite can the bite being so you know um, already uh, low in potential can still cause certain um, certain uh, certain damage so by wearing this um, this silk cloth actually you mm, you you get protected from these smaller um, hits, let's say that, however, can be very insidious, especially given what we were saying before about infections and so on. And arguably, th that's the majority of, of hits you, wa you would have received. Mm, it was pretty rare to get you know, a straight you know, shot from close distance, uh, and you, uh, at least if you arrived to get some of, uh, of those, you, you probably would have uh, got through uh, tens, if not of hundreds of other less uh, powerful hits that however could be uh, still uh, very very dangerous as, as we've seen um, and, and this was common practice mm -hmm. um, in uh, in in the uh, broadly speaking in not just in the Mongol world or the in, uh, in the uh, in the remains of the Mongol Empire um, but also um, in, in other countries that already use this form of um, of of um, multiple um, protections, also like the gambesons, etc., and more of that later. Um, the um, another mm, prominent feature in in the from Al Rashid excuse me, from Rashid al-Din's manuscripts is um, a spiked helmet uh, with an avantay. 
Hmm. The, the Mongol Avin tails, originally speaking, could be made of either even of leather. So I'm telling you, you know, the Avin tail is this essentially this um, aura of mail, or um, preferably also of uh, lamelle. Actually, there are lamellar Avin tails as well, and especially in this um, Persian context, that they actually appear prominently uh, into the uh, into the iconography um, and. Uh, the Avin tail is essentially this um, protection that uh, is attached to the helmet that usually is, um, especially in the East, is, is rarely a, a full helmet like the great helm that was being used in Europe that at exactly at this point and, and, and basically enveloped the whole head and uh, creating also certain problems of visibility of, 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 uh, of hearing and, and, and so on but that was thought for, for a specific warfare that in fact was probably also uh, that turned out to be ineffective against the ones of the Mongols because it was that the type of knights for instance that were defeated by the Mongols in in Eastern uh, Europe um, so 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 totally let's say but um, the in the East is there is this form of lighter a more dynamic uh, fighting style. Now, to ex so even the helmets are kind of usually smaller. They are they have this um, uh, skull cup form essentially, but not always because some of them could be naturally more enveloping as well. Um, and the Avin tail was um, used as a more flexible and, and lighter um, protection for also in here for the face. The Avin tail could protect even just your neck or even your entire face so it really depend it just hang it from the and it could actually prosecute uh, to to defend to um, and to basically fall on your um, on your shoulders on your so to cover all the everything it was below your 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 forehead uh, up to the your chest practically so this could vary a lot naturally there was no standardization at this point so everybody kind of Equipped w himself uh, how he wanted, especially in the in the Ilkhanid context, um, this Persian, uh, Mongol Persian, um, say uh, feudal nobles would have their own mil military gains. They would equip themselves essentially as as they they pleased. There was a very few centralized issued equipment that was put together the, the the local the military organization was pretty uh, decentralized in this sense um, I mean up to a certain point because also in here uh, I will not go into detail to the how this the ill Canid, uh, army was organized because it's complicated me we'll, we'll do it another time today we'll stick to this heavy cavalry men that represented the the elite of the um, ill Canid, uh of the ill Canid army actually because these were armies based prevalently on cavalry uh, which is pretty natural because the Mongols were um, basically almost all mounted armies uh, and uh, especially at the beginning and the um, and the Persians had a long tradition of feudal warfare in w to which cavalry dominated so um, it's also interesting to look at the Ilkhanate as this fusion of Mongol and, and Persian military uh, cultures and, and traditions. Um, so the I don't think the spiked helmet, helmet had a f uh, you know a, a much different use than you know just a helmet. Uh, the spike is something that theoretically you could s still use in, in, into combat because it, it you know combat is never something clean or linear or um, you know you can't literally do everything with this thing and naturally there would be certain um, um, the uh, uh, you know uh, decorations attached to to this to these spikes like crests and so on you have to imagine we'll see it now this army is to be extremely colorful by the way um, never think about I don't know the armies of antiquity or the Middle Ages as all gray or in uh, stuff like that. They were all colored in a way we we would be amazed to to see. Um, and the as for Avintel, yeah, we have seen how 
what what's that um, normally so um, maybe you know here I have put some pictures that essentially uh, depict the the kind of armor that would be used about which we could also spend a bit more of some word um, the, uh, the 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 kind of armor we see here is essentially the one that was standardly widespread all over the steppes mm? from the uh, Hungarian plains to um, the Bering Strait um, uh, if you look from the migration era onwards I mean up to the last century there were still populations who were wearing this exact form of armor mm? and naturally this was an elite um, uh, equipment not everybody could afford this at all this belonged to the to the uh, wealthiest, to the, mo to the more powerful, and uh, in fact, it, it made up this body of uh, heavy cavalry that traditionally in the steps were um, drawn from the uh, the clan, the over the uh, overlords clans. So, the steps is this extremely fluid environment, politically speaking, for which there are many peoples that basically uh, follow a greater leader that in that moment for a certain political, social, economical, demic reasons are more powerful in that context so that they are able even to extend uh, through their deterrence a, a control, uh, uh, in, uh, often in form of tribute also, over surrounding tribes. And, and, and naturally these overlords um, concentrate lots of resources through these tributes, through the uh, booty, through the loot, into their hands and they can afford better armor, better equipment. But this is very rare also because um, in, I mean to see such uh, equipment in there and so you understand that when you see this that, th that is the core of the, it's the bulk of the military of the of these steps uh, armies because otherwise the, the steps are extremely poor so even the actual absolute quantity of this armor is rare uh, it's pretty, it's pretty low um, and the um the the tactical role of these um heavy cavalrymen is to basically charge the enemy with a devastating uh, um, you know devastating attack um w once uh, the enemy is exhausted and softened up um by the um oceanic fire of um of arrows mm -hmm. And instead, um, are basically because all the, all the rest of, especially of these tributary populations, so that those ones that make the numerical, um, uh, quantitatively the largest part of the Mongolian ar uh, of these steppes armies, are all horse archers. So you have to imagine these massive battles for which there are horse uh, hordes of horse archers sh showering each other forever and then just this heavy cavalrymen remaining in reserve and just attacking at the end when the enemy is wavering and hoping to reverse the balance so actually uh, mm, the uh, these tactics were pretty standard and the, and the, the Mongols conquered the world uh, at that time through such tactics and if you look at this armor it's obviously um, designed to have a an homogeneous protection given especially to the torso and um, you see also uh, prosecuting down like a sort of gown um, to pretend that uh, to protect also the thighs that are very exposed especially when you're on horseback and you have also this um, arm protection and the helmet naturally and these are very uh, these are l lamellar uh, um, um, corselets that are extremely um, thick they're very difficult to penetrate and uh, mind that the the mongol bow is something extremely powerful it has an, a, an ex basically had the long, long um, the longest range of any other army at the time even more than the ones of the, uh, the uh, composite bows of the turks and uh, uh, and 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 the the mamluks against which the same uh, ilkhanids actually fought extensively into syria getting also defeated by but um, so these armor were conceived really primarily to stop that constant 
fire harassment and they were pretty effective because if you uh, there were actually arrows that were designed at this time to penetrate armor so actually the arrows could also vary in nature um, depending on th there were different types according to which distance which kind of enemy uh, you had to engage and, and and so on but we can not say that before the uh, practically the, the, the 16th century every missile weapon that was created so before the the development of of, of uh, arquebuses and muskets basically every single armor was created was effective against the type of of bullets that arrived mm. um, so it could stop them and that's why we we see in ancient medieval times this age of armor mm. because indeed that if you wore that you were basically immune from missiles um, in fact, it's pretty rare to find a source that states that I don't know a guy who was who was wearing the best armor available was killed by a bullet uh, by a missile that hit him, unless I don't know he had uh, opened his visor and uh, an arrow struck in his face, or unless it was you know uh, um, uh, a javelin or something uh, that I don't know stuck in into the um, you know between the plates of the armor, so in the uncovered spots. So what it means that is that these armors worked pretty well, and and the Mongols had uh, just like other steppes peoples had developed this form of armor, essentially to be immune from arrows. Although it was so expensive indeed that only a, a, a very elite, uh, a very numerical elite, uh, elite of the army could could wear it. Uh, the others relying actually on speed of mobility to hope to to avoid arrows in some way, but uh, probably not being extremely successful in that. Um, this was, I think, an important digression, <laughs> but uh, it's, pretty, uh, it's a bit generalistic in, in nature. So, um, the there were other... Um, naturally, w we look at these armors as single pieces, but you have to imagine that these um, protections were overloaded by other forms of defense, like buckles and uh, put up you know with laces and so on it all depended actually also on the on the uh, cavalry men's um, comfort mm -hmm. so um, as we were saying before everybody basically had an armor as that worked as they 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 pleased um, if they had enough uh, if they were wealthy enough they could afford a very um, different type of armor uh, very customized ones also the size of the armor was at that time um, practically um, conceived on the base of who had to, to use it, just like swords, by the way. So it was all, um, you know, it was a world that surely was very different from our own. Um, it, it was a manufacturing world, uh, but this allowed to have a much higher degree of customization for the single fighter. Mm. So for the tastes and the abilities of the single fighter. And this is very important because you realize sometimes even how certain swords in fact were conceived, how they... Um, uh, these were all ad hoc creations. Mm. Some of them sucked actually because we know that the, the uh, in these times there were extraordinary weapons and armors that today with our own technology we still can't replicate in, ter in ergonomic terms I mean th these guys knew much better than us what it took um, you know to make a good sword or a good armor than we do even if today we have the better uh, you know better technologies and that are so advanced and so on but you still have to think that for a, a I don't know a very good sword probably the manufacturer had produced other nine that were so so hmm? So there was a lot of also of empirical, a um, uh, lot of empirical systems to produce these things, and not everything was perfect naturally. But this is also not strictly related to the Ilkhanid heavy cavalrymen that we have to discuss now specifically. Um, you notice also prominently in these manuscripts these um, flaps uh, put at the uh, iron. Uh, excuse me, at the um, uh, covering the arm, 
So rather flaps than, than short sleeves, actually. Don't ask me why, because this is actually a very s superficial thing. I don't know, maybe there was some fashion uh, reason attached. Because this is also true, that there are fashions in war. Not everything that is worn on, on a battlefield is fully functional to war. Um, some things were also made and intended to, to show off a little bit. Um, uh, another important um, part of the story that we hinted at now is that the um, the armor was extremely decorated. They were usually colored. Mm -hmm. They were painted. So this armor that we uh, see sometimes all homogeneously depicted um, with a certain color is uh, naturally also deriving from uh, I mean sometimes uh, it was fairly um, n here we might make another powerful digression on the concept of um, standardization but it's too, it's too Let's say that th there were surely certain armor that were produced in series, right? Um, and some of them could be also be colored in a, in a unique fashion. And this is not something rare. I mean, the fact that this equipment was not standardized didn't mean that these armies weren't reaching for a degree of um, homogenization of some sort. Uh, the Mongols were especially feared and, fa and famed because of the... Um, even the visual effect that their armies made on the battlefield. The news was usually achieved through actually order and discipline and uh, these perfectly choreographed movements of the various uh, units and so on so that every single uh, part of the army knew exactly what, what to do. Every single unit was per or extremely ordered and, um, and obeying and, and, and to command swiftly and, and but uh, some t th there were other elements, like we were the ones we were talking about before, with these crests or colors or banners and so on. So even uh, showing an enemy, uh, y you know, showing a unit painted all in one color, um, or painted, let's say, that I one color meaning that not that everybody is actually wearing a, a uniformed color armor or other... other clothes it's it's just that they more or less all have the the color mm -hmm. in, in different ways so everybody can have different motives uh, different shades of that color but it was tried I think perhaps to to just make a single unit especially of a particular side kind of a company size to be easily identifiable because this is not just a matter to show off actually and to impress the enemy that can say, oh my god, these guys uh, are so into war that and so well organized that they can even find the time to for, for a detail such as having a, w uh, a single color. But this was also very functional to actually understand who was who on the battlefield and not just, you know, whose friend was enemy, but also which unit is that. And given that the Mongol armies were so dynamic, tactically dynamic, so speedy, they relied on this, uh, you know, back and forth of this. Uh, cavalry, um, you know, f feints and charges and so on, uh, distinguishing who was who on the battlefield, wh which unit was, and having a single color that could tell you that was definitely very, very important. But for the rest, naturally, everybody wore what they could, essentially. And it's not the color that eventually makes uh, the whole thing. But it can help. And that's why we find, even in pre-modern times, this um, degree of Uniformation that are not I inherently different from a functional point of view to, to what would happen later. Later, we simply have the Industrial Revolution. We can have uh, things produced in set, and they we probably we, we, we started to, to uniform the armies also, for but uh, because we had the means to do it better. But it, it something like that existed conceptually before. Obviously, it was for a, uh, aimed at a imminently practical. Pre uh, with a, it had a pretty um, uniquely practical function. Mm -hmm. So the various lamella could be s um, painted, uh, decorated in other ways, and, and this naturally 
um, you know, having a decorated armor means that you're also pretty well off because if you have an armor in the first place, you're well off. And this uh, heavy cavalry was practically, um, and and plus if you had decorations, you're even better. And this is what you find actually in all feudal societies. Hmm? At this time, I don't know, the French cavalry had, you know, um, the 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 high nobility had. Uh, on ho uh, finding a horseback had uh, golden spores, for instance. Um, Persia, it, as we've seen, was a, a, an intensely feudal um, uh, world. Naturally, had these forms of, of, and and the heavy cavalrymen surely had also uh, servants, assistants, and was the equivalent of the Western. Um, a knight in, in also in, in lifestyle and society this, these princes owned fortresses, lands, in, in serfs and, and so on. Mm. So it was all pretty pretty much more similar than we imagine. Naturally this was a, 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 a different uh, environment than the Western one, also especially in terms of taxi tactics and so on, but these are also relatively superficial when you look at the essential at the essential what the society really was. Mm. So, uh, so a feudal society. Um, the the helmets are in in uh, in the in our iconographic sources are also shown with um, uh, with their own cloth or leather head and tail, mm -hmm. um, and they are usually rendered um, in the manuscript in the illuminations with a blue color. Now we don't know what this is uh, meant to be because actually. Uh, this probably means that they were made of iron or steel, um, and the spikes were usually colored in gold. Also, so also here we find a golden feature that was typical of the elites of the heavy cavalry in general. Um, um, but also in here, helmets could definitely be painted. There were also other. Um, forms of, um, for for instance, brocade was definitely used also over the uh, over the uh, helmets. We have several several of this um, evidence, also archaeologically speaking, and and the whole thing was not um, so it was normal at the time. So obviously we're talking still about the elite. So it wasn't something you find you find on a regular base in, in the army, but definitely. The heavy cavalry displayed such forms of, of decorations and so on. So we get the beautiful spectacle of these knights. It must have been fantastic. Um, now there were naturally other parts of armor that uh, also in here were related to the deg degree of customization uh, that the, uh, the equipment could could have. So. Um, what we see is that towards the the end of the 13th century, in fact, the um, the the original Mongol cavalryman has substantially weighted up. The armor is uh, heavier, the protection is higher, and uh, and this is due to also naturally to to the uh, to the process of conquest and sedentarization. Because in the Mongol mindset, the first thing was the loot. So you conquer such a place like Persia that uh, was such a powerful um, uh, power, such a wealthy power at the time. So first you sack these places, you get the loot, and you start also this loot is made up of local armor and so on, so this immediately brings you to, to, to wear that b because of better protection. Um, and then when the Ilkhanid dynasty settles and the the Mongols start start living in there and organizing the, the the state and you know being rooted to the local, um, getting increasingly rooted to the local uh, affairs. The um, they also start to uh, absorb the sedentary lifestyle. Mm, originally speaking, you know the Mongols had done essentially back and forth from this from in, in Eurasia. They they often came back. All you know, the the for instance the invasion of Central Europe was aborted simply because of the death of the Great Khan. So that all the Mongols came back into Mongolia and they 
uh, to elect a new khan and then start and, and, and therefore their control was often based also on the tyrants the 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 great slaughters that you know and destructions like think about Baghdad that was bo wiped out at the time or Merv that was the most populated city of the world at the time um, were aimed were not just because the Mongols uh, people say oh wow these were barbarians were so brute no it was actually all an extremely intelligently calculated political and military move to say okay if we want to show the local population that if, if these guys wanted they could have raised them raised them to the ground mm -hmm. so naturally it's obvious that yeah the, the Mongols at the beginning were not even so um, used to uh, the uh, the advantages of sanitary life and eventually they I quite immediately start to, to appreciate that the Mongols found the Mongols were very, very interested also about many, uh, you know, given that at the time religion and science were the same thing, um, the Mongols were extremely fascinated gi given their religion and their celestial deity, uh, given they in, into astronomy. Mm? The, the Mongols, you know, sh moving in the thousands of kilometers uh, across the, 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 uh, the dull uh, steppe, they often orientated themselves also with the stars so they always had this kind of interest and when they got into places like Persia in fact that actually were extremely developed since antiquity for the studies of the stars um, they had also these ex uh, extremely famous observatories and then that especially in the uh, at this time the Islamic culture had absorbed of the knowledge of the, the um, astronomy slash astrology because also the two things at the time were were uh, were the same um, the the Mongols were extremely fascinated by these things and they immediately kind of got grow closer to the local culture thanks to the interest that this progressed interest towards the the stars and the and the skies in general um, and um, so Unavoidably, the Mongols at this point in this phase of uh, of sanitarization, they they get heavier equipment, because that's what local society practically does. And this is something you find, actually, in Persia, to have happened all the times. Because Persia, objectively, as uh, is an Indo-European country as well, and and it, because it was conquered by these peoples of the steppes that were all um, more, um, let's say. Um, uh, that were all, uh, all horse riding peoples essentially came to settle into Persia and the normal pattern that you find in this evolution is that actually the local populations also to the nature of the Iranian plateau that um, is very different from Mesopotamia let's say because it allows more uh, more of a feudal society given also the, the, nat the nature of the territory um, it's full of castles of, of mountains and so on um, it um, it pushes for this the maintenance of a certain, in fact, um, horse-based warfare, cavalry-based warfare, um, and the the process, however, is, is that uh, feudalism in this sense is is already sedentary. Mm -hmm. So the process is that the these peoples of the steps that arrived were usually lighter, like the Medians, you know, the ones that gave origin to the Achaemenid Achim dynasties were Scythians in practically um, they came in there they, they had also in there there were this kind of ho mm, mm, horse riding people of the steppe with a with a bulk of heavy cavalry and lots 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 of horse archers and they settled in Persia also in Mesopotamia of course it's also in more strictly sedentary uh, areas and they what happens is that maintain um, a great uh, that cavalry maintains a, a great importance, but at the same time, it gets heavier. And in this sense, also tactics ch uh, s start to vary a little because they're not excess. Um, they're still very mobile. They're still very fluid, but they are not as fluid and as dynamic as the ones previously of the steps. But still, the cavalry man remains retains its power. And by the way, Persia, uh, the Iranian plateau. Um, being huge and largely diverse in climate and in, in terrain is that in and being exposed also to al bordering the steppe always so the settlement of um, of other groups of nomadic tribes that the Persian authorities always also um, kind of 
mm, favored because um, they represented this injection of new populations of the steps that could be used as a um, could become faithful to the local monarchy given the um, the allowance that was granted to them to settle in in, in, in those lands but and and, and and therefore this could create a personal bond between the sovereign and these new uh, en entries let's say um, there was a mostly military bond that could be used also to contain the uh, other aristocracies all around. This happened also in Europe, uh, you know, in, in, in Hungary, in Poland. Uh, the local monarchies always settled consistent, mm, you know, uh, amounts of, of, of people that were flying, uh, were coming from the steppes, especially when the Mongols invaded the Eurasian steppes. They there were lots of uh, nomadic populations that they uh, took refuge into into Europe and that were settled by the Poles and the Hunger and the Hungarians into there. So uh, and and uh, and it worked in the same way because the the Hungarian and Polish uh, kings were basically trying to counter the push of their nobility by uh, hiring these um, nomadic. Um, elements that eventually ended up to, to be settled down also in there and to mix with the rest of the population. Um, so the pr progressive widening of the um, Mongol cavalry uh, happens because um, start seeing also other elements that become more uh, u um, usual. Like uh, by the end of the 3rd century we have tubular bambrasses so this um, more um, this protection for for the arm that is functional in the sense that it usually covers your wall forearm so um, it um, it basically keeps your uh, your um, the uh, both your wrist and your elbows functioning because they they're not closed and uh, usually it's interesting that the arm properly is is not that protected or at least there is a part of, of maybe of the main uh, torso corset that, that extends a bit over your shoulders and, and the van brace but let's say that rarely there is an armor that closes perfectly your 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 um, um, first of all both your armpit and your elbow mm -hmm. because flexibility Obviously, of th of the um, superior uh, um, uh, uh, limbs is uh, is uh, is crucial in into combat. Then other um, armor is uh, the knee guards. Mm -hmm. Knee guards are very important because um, they it's easy to fall into into war so the um the also knee is a pretty delicate um joint so given this mounted combat that however could also arrive to do it could also evolve into dismounted combat you let's not think that the mongols were exclusively about mounted combat especially in this uh, ilkhanid context there was a a certain type of culture that we will probably discuss better afterwards when talking about the bucklers um, that also mm, contemplated certain kind of foot combat so the elbow having uh, knee guards was extremely important because you it allowed you you know to to knee uh, to, to be much more mobile without minding of taking a very strong hit on the knee and you know <laughs> not not walking anymore uh, naturally, the word greaves, so that they are the equivalent uh, of vambraces for uh, inferior uh, limbs, and they are also pretty useful, especially in mounted combat, because um, the you know essentially when you are a cavalryman, you are constantly exposed to any form of of of, of hit because you're a big target even your horse naturally is um, horses were also covered in this you know, in mongol warfare by um, by armor uh, so the w actually the, the composition probably is the same of cavalrymen um, although it, uh, at all times in history actually the um, 
horse armor has been much less frequent than the uh, cavalryman armor. This for, for many reasons. Um, it, it really depends on the tactical role that the cavalry is going to have. Um, in spite of all, uh, it's more important when you're on or you are on horseback to have agility than. So paradoxically, even the if, if, even if horses are pretty delicate animals, so it, they can get um, uh, crippled pretty pretty easily into combat. It's sometimes better to to have them running faster than actually even being protected. And in fact, certain, especially in Persia, you notice that most of what also the Seljuk armors have been, I had always been half armored horses uh, with a frontal um, uh, and chest uh, protection rather than a full armor. That naturally, horses, by the way, were always wore, very often wore, probably much often than sources, uh, iconographical sources show us, they, they wore padded coats. And a very important evo evolution into um, also between uh, Persian and Mongol warfare is that, um, especially in certain regions of eastern Iran, that were the ones that were more affected by the Asian, uh, the Central Asian military cultures, is that the padded coat is increasingly abandoned or at least uh, complemented with a lamellar armor for the horse as, as well. But usually, it was the heavy cavalryman was coerced and the the horse was relatively less curious. Um, so greaves, and this is what I, I was talking about, are you know pretty exposed, not just to arrow fire that can come literally from everywhere, but also from the below in the sense that you know if you engage against uh, infantry, as it was, you know, uh, the, the Mongols had meant Persian armies at this point also had bo large bodies of infantrymen with lances and all, you want your your legs that are so closely exposed to the enemy to be pr well protected. So greaves are actually much more frequent than other elements of the armor, and but probably you can say that uh, yeah, probably both superior and inferior limbs now were pretty homogeneously defended. Um, even if you hadn't the resource, you you would dis distribute them pretty equally on them. Uh, very interestingly, in, in 13th century, um, in, in the Ilkhanid cavalry, there seems to have been uh, heavy cavalry, um, this kind of co called mirror armor, that it's in practice um, two, two plates, respectively on the chest and on the back, actually secured and, and tied to each other by straps. So this is actually a pretty frequent um, form of armor that you find uh, in many other populations in history that's pretty evident um, it's w if you can't have a full um, body armor or even if you have and you want to protect better your chest that is naturally where your heart is your uh, you you don't want it to be you want to protect it um, you basically put those pla additional plates to your chest in and the back hmm? Think about the Romans back in the day with, uh, with the cardiophylax, for instance. They did to it. it was pretty normal to be there. Um, it's actually a Greek term. I mean, it literally existed everywhere at all times. What is interesting is that when you wear a lamellar armor, generally speaking, I think it's enough because lamellar armor is really the, as we've seen before, the, the top thing you can ever wear. It's extremely. Um, costly, it's, but it's extremely effective and uh, it really stops blows pretty pretty well. It also has this, um, it doesn't absorb hits um, as much as the, I don't know, a, a coat of mail can do, because the mail is pretty good and it's being conceived especially in the West um, because to avoid cut wounds, but the mail armor doesn't prevent you to get very tough hits beneath, so Actually, if you get hit even by a bullet, by a mace or something like that, you can die with, uh, of internal trauma without splitting, sp uh, spilling a, a, a drop of blood from the outside, but, you know, basically collapsing from the within. Um, um, the, um, so these uh, plates uh, were actually pretty widespread in, for instance, in Seljuk armor, Interestingly enough, and the Persians, uh, especially before the Mongol, especially Western Persians, 
usually realigned, most of all on, on coat of mail, on mail armor, yes. Um, and and given the the nature of mounted warfare at the time, you know, the, the Seljuks were a bit more similar, let's say, well, let's maybe we can't say that, but, you know, chest protection is something that starts appearing this time also as as in plate um, in, in, in the West. And it's it's partly uh, also, uh, there are actually, there is a c uh, an endless debate of why this happened, how. I also made a video actually on, on the topic myself when discussing the emergence of um, code of plates in the West, which started from Germany and essentially at the same time the Mongols attacked, arri arrived at the gates of Germany telling us that uh, some people have found, have presumed to find a connection in that, but uh, it's, you know, it's interesting but I it's not all probably. According to me it has also a lot to do with kind of feudal warfare and the idea of um, charges becoming uh, increasingly more effective and therefore, you know, having these lengths arriving at an excruciatingly speed uh, targeting your chest or face so that's why at this time you have plate armor for the torso and also you know these great helms and enclosing your face finally and becoming always heavier and heavier so why can't I find this uh, it's in medieval mm, warfare playlist however what the hell here we go it's called, the video is called Origins of the Western Code of Plates, second half of the 13th century. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, and it deals also partly with the Mongols, because um, there is the hypothesis that basically, uh, especially this increased need of protection was partly triggered also by the, uh, the defeats that the Germans and the Poles suffered against the, the Mongols uh, at the time. And the Poles seemingly had something similar, but in 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 uh, in, uh, in ladder, the so-called Polish belt was something that actually protecting not much of the chest, but actually most of the abdomen. But this is this is not important. The point is that, in my opinion, as long as um, the Mongols began to be in Persia, they partly brought the lamellar armor in, especially in the east. In the West, instead, they kind of started adopting coat of mail themselves, and this coat of mail uh, was less protective than the um, lamellar one, less expensive. So here, it's a matter of of, of costs and benefits, and depending, it's not uh, uh, you know uh, an involution at all. But in this sense, they would be more eager eager to to wear chest plates like the mirror armor that we described before in order to add this uh, protection um, for their torso and, and the vital organs that are inside of it. Uh, and uh, this is particularly interesting also because th there is a source from the early Mongol times that I don't remember I should find it now. Ba basically, however, it's maybe it's not so important The then uh, Oh yeah, maybe if I, I, I it's from Matthew Paris actually. Um, uh, what wh he was talking about the uh, Mongol heavy cavalrymen and s stating that they had this leather armor of oxides uh, strengthened with iron plates, hmm? adding that uh, in this context that this protection allegedly was just in the front and that they were unarmored in the back in order to discourage um, them turning and fleeing. This is um, this opens another interesting... Uh, first of all, Matthew Paris wit uh, witness is very um, very interesting, account is very interesting, but um, naturally it's a bit in naive in the sense that um, yeah, it is true. The Mongols had just like I don't know in the West and in, in the Islamic world, there was this kind of chivalric mentality that, and naturally, actually, the, the Mongols didn't have a really a chivalrous mentality in in a feudal sense. They were much more pragmatical, much more effective in this sense. 
also because they crushed feudal armies both in the in Europe and in the Middle East. Um, however, th this was the general idea of every warlike society that you know people who flee are cowards and therefore they in order to be prevented fleeing they should also be unarmored in their back but this is very ideal these are things uh, stories that you find also into the um, you know in the uh, chivalric epic and, and so on in we know that reality was different uh, um, it was different in fact as we've just seen because this mirror uh, armor even at least the proof that at least in, in Ilkhanid Persia heavy cavalry wore uh, armor both in the front and in the back of, of the torso but there are probably more pra practical reasons for this first of all as we've seen armor costs a freaking lot so you can't sometimes you have to decide to make a compromise and you, you should ask yourself how frequently uh, a knight like this heavy cavalry wh which usually also came into battle at the very end hmm, that could find naturally itself in, in, a, in an infinite kind of situ different tactical situations so it, this, al this is also an approximation but the, the, the idea is that if when heavy cavalry kicks in it's because it's, 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 it's the end in a way or in another so they they have just to charge straight because they if they are if they are out everything is lost anyway so the idea is that it's better maybe for that knight to have while charging a much better protection in the front than in the back because that can make the difference also for for that attack to succeed or at least it can be you know a, a factor that can influence that positively so it's actually not devoid of you know of truth that maybe some of these cavalrymen were intend in fact to be more armored in the front for the same wh which it which makes sense because it's objectively also aimed at thinking you know if I turn I have my back uncovered and it can be killed by anything also in here the silk uh, coats and stuff like that especially for the light calorie men were pretty pretty effective because in this sense they, they were projected to, to stop arrow fire you know the, the silk um, coats that um, got filled with air while running on horseback is something you find also in, in feudal Japan for instance and that, that was uh, uh, very effective to prevent arrows to hit your back while you were running because you had uh, this massive air bag of, of silk that um, you know absorbed those hits just filling with the with the wind while you were running on horseback so uh, it's a mix of situations and indeed they are interpretable in part to saying oh, you know th that guy is um, if he is more armored in the front he's less prone to flee to turn and flee also because it objectively has m uh, a greater edge while charging frontally if he's better uh, armored in the front and naturally many accounts all over military history you find things like ah that guy was shot in th in the rear was killed it was wounded in their ears so when they found his corpse we knew that he was fleeing he was massacred in this shameful way and the better he was killed because he was a covert um, and this is actually probably more um, it's truer than we think because many people believe that I know these battles were a sort of chaotic melee where every w of single individual fights but this is actually never been an historical thing all armies in history have always fought sticking together always there's never been those um hollywood's melee fight that ev to which everybody you know turns around finds an enemy and slaughters it uh, without any total direction humans fight in one and only single way in all over by, by nature and that is sticking together so objectively if you find someone who is um you know if you stay in, in that formation uh, you're gonna hi be hit necessarily from the front unless you're not fleeing although it is true that th there is always some mm, crazed uh, fighter that gets to uh, to a head from the others and uh, which ab do not advance as much as him so he goes alone and at that point it's an extremely risky moment it's probably the riskiest moments of any melee so the melee as this that guy has to turn his back at a certain point and that exposes him unavoidably to hits and and those are probably some of the most 
frequent hits in all melees. Um, at least this is what we we're seeing from HEMA, from you know other, other reenactments that tell us essentially that's how. So either you, if you get wounded in the back, either it's because you found yourself in that situation, having over distance from your formation and you have you need to come back because you're too close to the enemy and you get uh, wounded in back and certain swords especially are very good with that like sabers and so on to, to wound in that fashion either it's because the wall formation has collapsed at that point you've turned your back and you're pursued and you're slaughtered so there are this kind of um, of dynamics um, as well um, so we're talking about heavy cavalry, and heavy cavalry is um, naturally meant, as we were saying before, to have a shock power through its charge. Mm -hmm. These guys represented the elite, the bulk of the army. They um, they were sent in in the moments of greatest difficulty, and they were men. And naturally, they had a, mu a much higher degree of training than the average horse archers that was, especially in early Mongol times, were extremely. Um, trained but it, it wasn't as resourceful as skillful as omnicomprehensively trained for every using every kind of weapon like the um, like the heavy cavalrymen telling the truth also horse archers so light cavalry ha was equipped with uh, um, weapons like maces for instance that suggest that they could fall onto an armored enemy as well in spite of being unarmored themselves so this is very interesting because it also tells very much about the very um, uh, fire-like uh, military ethos of the tribal mongol tribal warrior originally speaking but eventually in Ilkhanid Persia this Calderman rep were representing now, as we were saying before, uh, seen before an elite that was also social, etc. And this is where the the only ones who could basically train for all their lives with all kind of weapons. And um, this is pretty homogeneous. Essentially, when you have a feudal society, it doesn't matter which time and space in history you have, essentially the highest degree of of military professionals in history of humanity. Uh, because these are people who spend literally their whole life on horseback training with every kind of weapon. And that's what they do for all their lives. Mm -hmm. Even with their old people. If they are if they are lucky to, to, to arrive at that as, uh, through a, a life of warfare, which is nearly impossible. But this happened and this heavy um, cavalry was meant, in fact, uh, however, primarily, especially in combat, you know, you know, in 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 information, um, for shock power, uh, with uh, w with uh, for for a charge was carried out uh, with a lance. So individually, these guys could fight l really with every kind of weapon. But what made them effective in the practice of warfare in in in, in a pitch battle was fighting information. Mm. And therefore, and th that's what they mostly trained for. That's what it ma made the difference between, a, uh, say. A uni, uh, a tribal warrior that really wants to fight just with his own few guys, and you know, being part of a professional army with the better, the best logistics in of the time, like the Mongol one, that was something incredibly amazing. You know, um, Mongol logistics is nothing to envy to the Roman one. Um, it was probably also even more developed, um, <coughs> and it's uh, and that's how the Mongols actually made it to conquer the world. It was mostly logistics as always and these guys were amazing and their armies had amazing tr collective training so this wasn't just about singular units of this heavy elite it was also really about the whole army and this also gives a dimension of how much the um, Mongol overlords were able to impose their own mm, authority and discipline on on the on these populations Be coming from a, essentially a tribal nomadic um, context. Um, so for saying that um, the world of the step is much, uh, it's very highly militarized, uh, it necessarily requires by uh, for, for, re for uh, reasons of survival, the not the rationalization, but however the somehow the achievement of this form of, of discipline, and that's why in, in by the way in these tribal societies 
um, the um, personal bonds of loyalty were so excruciatingly important because that's a way through which more primitive populations into history lacking a central authority, a centralized, they, they, um, that can confer discipline to the world system, rely on this kind of ethical code mm, that makes for it. And uh, not always in, in you know, with the same results, but in the case of the Mongols, something that was pretty much well assumed. And the Mongols had uh, an extremely functional hierarchy in this sense. So, you can imagine the Ilkhanid heavy cavalrymen charging this massive... Uh, so, inheriting really the best of the tradition of, I don't know, the Mongols, the Khwarazmians, the Persians, and so, uh, and so on. And um, the um a characteristics of of mongol heavy cavalry was that it um it could make uh, an extensive use of of um of bows uh, and arrows as well this is complicated to explain i mean why you know because for instance in other feudal societies this doesn't exist in the west um uh, at least allegedly um Heavy the heavy cavalry didn't use um, bows. Mm. This is actually false because we know that perfectly that the the European nobility knew how to use bows and arrows just for the simple fact that they went hunting uh, as a sport, um, and and and, um, and 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 certain knights definitely used also crossbows as sidearms. So it doesn't matter what the Lateran Council said, <laughs> you know. Uh, one thing are the ideals of chivalry and honor uh, is the practice of warfare that is always much less um you know nice than than we we imagine but it, here it's a, a really a deep question because i mean it we know the answer of course is that in in the actually in the east that is something in europe we, we never had objectively it the the bow is associated uh, to the military prowess while in the west the bow has been stigmatized essentially as a cowardly weapon because you can't kill in the distance without engaging actually in countries like japan and uh, the in others actually all over asia the bow is really a symbol of military prowess and especially in the peoples of the steppes that's kind of their national weapon so uh it's a noble weapon this is what i what i'm trying to say so it was normal but this gets to more pragmatic considerations, r also for heavy cavalry to use these bows. Now, why? Because you know the tactical differentiations, historically speaking, have always intended to 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 push for um, you know es an essentially shock cavalry and an, an essentially skirmish cavalry. Um, there have been hybrids, historically speaking, but these hybrids eventually tended to to finish. Um, and these hybrids, however, were proper of the steps. Why is this? Well, because as we and, and this can be interesting now because the the Mongols, as we've seen, were not ex uh, didn't have originally extremely heavy cavalry. So in part, they could integrate successful this ability of shooting with the bow during the during the combat. Then this happened a bit like even with the Persians and so on, uh, the Parthians, the Sasanids. Uh, initially speaking, coming from the steps, they had this kind of hybrid, you know, the heavy cavalrymen who could shoot also with arrows. So this, this is a kind of, it's interesting because it, first of all, it degrees, it shows the degree of professionalism of these guys. So these were guys who could both soften up the enemy with their enemy formations with their bows and then charge with their contus into the line. Uh, this was an elite, and naturally there was still a large amount of horse light horse archers that did most of that job as archers but this hybrid still survived then when it they, these um, peoples get sedentarized usually this hybrid ceases to exist and there is a more sharp differentiation between the heavy cavalrymen and the uh, skirmisher in this time mongol mm, even if the mongol military traditions of the steppes had not ceased to exist the bow is still very important so you still find into these Ilkhanid heavy cavalry, the um, practice of putting the legs from one side and shooting with the bow. 
Uh, we know the Mongols, um, especially the light cavalry, could have up to uh, three bows, for instance, and um, uh, then sources uh, are a bit uh, varied on the actual number of arrows. For, in for instance, um, um, the uh, Marco Polo says that um, the, the Mongols had usually uh, 60 arrows each, um, and uh, 30 smaller ones for piercing and 30, uh, 30 larger with broads, uh, broad heads for discharging at close quarters. Mm -hmm. um, there are other sources also to say that uh, the um, Mongol um, arrows was were longer than the, the one of other populations and this is probably true because the the Mongol um, bow, composite bow, was uh, had a much wider range than a much longer range than the one of other populations and um, so they could basically uh, shoot at the distance without even being hit um, theoretically um, but um, uh, and, and this needs uh, obviously for t for the arrow to be longer because this allows to maintain more stability in flight. So it's actually uh, realistic as an assessment. Um, so um, the idea is that this cavalry may could could put their lengths aside wh while they were not engaged into you know they were not to charge or maybe they were about to charge but still they had to wait so they could participate to the arrow fire and there were there was a, a system that is depicted in the sources for the Ilkhanid cavalry that consisted in essentially having a of fixing of stuffing the uh, lengths into a waist belt and um, and and also through a, um, a small loop um, near the butt uh, passing the foot so basically it's as if you had put this lens from one side and then you could take it back and to use it for, for charging. Um, these lenses were usually um, say from 2.7 to 3.6 meters long. So they were pretty, I mean relatively long lenses, well suited for charging definitely. Um, and um, they could be uh, grabbed in um, you know many ways. Uh, this distinction is kind of senseless, telling the truth, because every single cavalryman in history has used the lengths in every possible way that we can't even imagine. So you have the couché, uh, uh, you know, underarm lengths, uh, the two-hand grip, the uh, overarm thrust, uh, lengths could can be thrown as well, so this is all, all things that all old knights did at all times doesn't matter what the, the they had in their hands also because what when um, when you are into fight um, it's not that your mind is so clear so you can't do many things that are also pretty irrational we are nothing but big apes and when we freak out essentially we start like it happens a lot in to fight doesn't matter how you're trained progr uh, progressively you're still a big ape and you start um, even I don't know using the butt of your 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 rifle to crush an enemy skull instead of shooting <laughs> you know um, and that's what we are so weapons were used in the most inimaginable ways um, another very important um, uh, there were s a certain side. We these were the main weapons. Then there are side weapons, or maybe partly also main weapons, dependingly on. And it usually was the saber. The saber is this naturally curved, long, curved, thin uh, s uh, blade that uh, sword that is prominent into the into the Asian East, indeed. <coughs> Excuse me, which is. Um, It's di it's a bit difficult to explain certain things because curved swords have always existed pr pretty much everywhere. But sabers proper, so these thinner and longer curved blades, are something that um, are seemingly have been brought from the from the east of the steps rather than the west of the steps. 
they arrive in Europe all, only seemingly also with the Avars, the the Bulgars and the um, and the Hungars. So something that pertains seemingly to the most mostly Eastern world and the uh, the Mongols had. Actually, um, it's a bit of a cliche of considering the sabers as a properly Eastern thing, but if you objectively look at the you know, the average, that, that's how it is. Actually, the Persian, uh, up to that point, had mostly used n straight blades. I mean, if you look at Sasanian blades, also the, the Islamic era blades, these were, these were usually straight, which actually uh, the same concept of the um, of the Europeans were at this time in the West and from the Iron Age onwards, because all they all came from this cauldron of the steppes uh, the that had developed that kind of uh, non-curved sword uh, at least the, the longest one. Then there were things like the the copies or the sacks that naturally were curved, but these were more like, you know, long long knives. O okay, some of them were long, even seventy centimeters, like swords, but they were the the the, uh, the average sword tended to be straight. So you we have, especially in in the Middle Ages, this injection of of sabers at a certain point, eventually even take root into into more Western military traditions and um, the Mongols made extensive use of this um, usually um, swords with one cut require perhaps less training than one with double um, um, with double-edged sword um, so it can be that especially these great masses of light Mongol cavalrymen um, were preferred they usually prefer this sword, but you s you you find it also into the into the um, heavier uh, knights that were m much more highly trained for uh, sword combat. So it's actually extremely complicated to explain why the curved sword uh, seemingly mo developed more in in the east than the west. It's, it also depends probably on other factors. Um, uh, this is also an interesting point that you can see. What, for, for instance, in pair with the shields, the shields, the um, the uh, the here of the Ilkhanid heavy cavalrymen seem to have not been larger than uh, thirty, fifty centimeters in diameter. So this means there were pretty small shields. Actually, it's more similar like bucklers. People have wondered why. Well, usually uh, shields get so small when uh, the the cavalryman is um, enough armored. It, it's it, what you see. It's happening in Europe in the, in in the same century, thirteenth century. At this point is that sm shields uh, become always smaller. And you arrive in the fifteenth century, you have this kind of ridiculous small square, while the guy is in full plate armor and 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 even abandons the shield at a certain point, preferring maybe a pole armor or a double handed sword. Um, f even for defense, I mean. Um, in so this is an explanation. The second is explanation is also if you look at the saber and the um, uh, of the buckler combined, you realize it's an extremely dynamic fencing in here. Um, and telling the truth, uh, we don't have to imagine this. Ilkhanid cavalrymen just framed in this massive Mongol armies that invaded Syria, fighting this mas massive epic battles against the Mamluks and so on. But um, as feudal men, uh, there were um, there was also a lot of individualistic ethos from a military point of view. So that even issuing something to challenging someone to to single combat, or even a certain type of training, w was extremely widespread as a practice and such um, weapons were perfectly thought for even traditional duels or however it is kind of staged uh, individual fight so uh, telling the truth also the the the, the lamellar armor was um, left many parts of the body uncovered uh, not m so many actually but there were also in here we should get a bit more in detail, but uh, let's say that there were ways you could basically trust other p uh, or, 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 sl or slash in two parts that were a bit uncovered, so that the these armors were much less homogeneous than we think sometimes. At least 
when it got to you know all the lower protections than the canonic steps lamellar full body lamellar um, um, uh, armor that by the way could be used practically mostly only on horseback because it was so heavy that it also um, created problems for movement so even on foot that as we have seen was also practice combat really um, this um, combination of mace, uh, excuse me, of um, saber and, 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 uh, and buckler w equated to a, a very dynamic fencing that looked at hitting fast and sneakily on the uh, exposed parts of the body and there is probably a wall tradition, military tradition there that we can't just see the, the surface of it was actually quite spread in this indiv individualistic mindset of the feudal warrior as well. After all, judicial duelists uh, 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 had a similar kind of equipment also in in Europe. Uh, I made a video, this can be interesting as well. The one of uh, the... The effigy of uh, Malvern Abbey. Uh, it's titled 13th Century Armor and Buckler. And this this is in England. So just for saying that uh, we are in the same 13th century of the Ilkhanids now, so it's interesting to also to compare East and West and how certain traditions existed also here. However, the also a very prominent weapon that, as we've seen, was used even by the light infantry that usually doesn't doesn't uh, bring such weapons is the mace. Now the mace, especially in the steppes world, is a, a, a very strong symbol of leadership that has been exported as such also in other populations telling the truth. Um, now it's complicated to, to explain because there are so many also religious meanings etc but the idea is that in a nutshell that the mace is able to crush armor or at least to smash underneath uh, what is underneath. So the mace is u preferably used not just to attack someone who, who is armored but also be to be used in this sense by someone who is armored as well. So you can't pierce an, uh, a full Miller armor with a sword usually the best weapon is the mace so it's the m it's a word of uh, it's the armor of the knights mm -hmm. it's something you find in fact wh why is that maces and pole arms come back to be so not pole arms but um, how you call them the things like hammers and, um, and other you know blunt weapons come so much more in to use um, into the late Middle Ages. It's because full plate armor begins, and, and and that those weapons are mostly used by the same cavalry. While the majority of the unarmored peasants, let's say, would use a pole arm that makes you fight at, at a security distance from the from the enemy. So. This is wherever you find a mace, usually, especially if it's spiked, if it has a shape that is most you, you can see it's mostly conceived to, to, to hit armor, especially when it's angled. When you see an angled fl uh, flange on, on the mace, you, you realize that that's for piercing armor because that's the shape that is best physically fit for, for causing a structural damage to the metal, how it is made. So I think everything here w is. Um, I mean, these are the essentials. Okay, so it's um, the Elkanid heavy cavalryman is not substantially different by many other cavalrymen, but it does have some features that kind of explain the that can be explained by the that are superficial in part, secondary if you want, but they are interesting because they tell us about this Mongol-Persian fusion also military tradition. So relatively to this I would like to conclude actually with uh, what I was hinting at a little bit before that is um, how the different parts of Persia actually received different types of um, of influence from Mongol warfare. So First of all, th there is a very important um, 
consideration to make in general is that when the Mongols invaded Persia as well as other countries, they unavoidably demonstrated <laughs> that they were better at fighting than those who were there. Being better at fighting doesn't mi matter; uh, doesn't have anything to do with being courageous or so on. Forget this other stupid prejudice that exists. It has to do with organization. Point. You can be brave as you like, but you're gonna be annihilated if uh, you don't have an organization and discipline, and so on. A logistics and so on. So the Mongols actually showed that they, their prestige as, uh, as. Uh, in their mm, military art, in the in the military art. So, nevertheless, as we've seen, there were lots of Persians who, at all times, kept fighting together with the Mongols at this time. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting is that uh, there were also Western influences at this point, because actually the um, the Ilkhanids came mm, came to rule on places that arrived up to the Black Sea, for instance. Um, in the Indian Ocean, and we have seen there were lots of trade, especially with the Italians. So uh, sometimes there were um, um, Italian sailors and marines at this point used, not just in Black Sea, which was normal because the Italians were expanding there at the point, but also even in the Persian Gulf, mm, um, in in uh, along the Arabian coast and Persian coast, because uh, they were tra being there. So. Uh, uh, in the arsenal of the Ilkhanid state, there was, there was also these Western mercenaries of some sort, um, and the um, that's pretty obvious because it was full of uh, Italian and other Western European merchants in into into um, you know into Ilkhanid um, into the Ilkhanid orbit, and, and surely some of them have been hired as mercenaries. These are Hebrew and Italian sources to tell us. And the, um, the Western Iran, um, this is the point I was making before, was much less influenced than, um, than Eastern Iran by the Central Italian, uh, excuse me, Central Asian, <laughs> I was talking about Italians now, so, uh, Central Asian military traditions. Mm -hmm. So, Actually, in, in Western Iran, it seems that the the impact of Mongol military tradition has been pretty low. Um, and the uh, the reason is partly the fact, it's partly geographical in the sense that objectively Western Iran is a bit more, it's, but it's a bit less open to the steppes than, than the... Um, then the eastern and part mm, that opens the more the most and then has a few geographical limit borders to today. So it's normal that the Western Iran would remain a bit more a bit less influenced by these external influences. And um, the There is also an, uh, uh, another point that is very interesting about the Mongol invasion of the Ilkhanid, excuse me, of the, the creation of the uh, Ilkhanate in, into Persia, is that the Mongols brought in a certain mm, armament production and um, logistical systems that at this point were seemingly the most advanced in the world. Um, so this worked as long as there was a, s a functioning state, naturally, that could manage this um, huge amount of resources, then eventually crumble a little bit. But the idea is that um, there was probably a fallout of m Mongol military technology, as we have seen, was a mix of, of many different cultures, some of the most advanced of the world at the time, like the, one, the Chinese ones, that were exported in some way. Uh, think about all the knowledge, the know-how, the technology was now uh, exported also from these lands into Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, all these Europeans arriving up to China and, and taking back uh, astonishing, uh, you know, inven uh, knowledge, inventions. Uh, the, the gunpowder is at uh, this time traveling on the Silk Road from China to Europe and to be to be 
you know, the f all the various formulas and the know-how being, and, and as at this point that the the Europeans start using the first um, experimenting the first um, uh, firearms. Um, talking about Eastern Iran and actually other regions like the one of Kashmir and and what is now Pakistan, actually, um, the the Mongols had a much greater impact. First of all, from a strictly strategical reason, it's one we were mentioning now, is that there are less um, geographical borders. So the 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 Mongols launched um, massive raids into this area, is and and they probably also caused more damage uh, that eventually uh, caused the the local um, powers to, to be capable of, of influencing much less Mongol military culture in turn than what Western Iran could do. Um, so in the, the mid 13th century Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan as we've seen felt into the hands of the Ilkhanids and uh, this was basically to fragment only into the uh, first half of the 14th century. So this meant that uh, at the moment of fragmentation, especially the eastern, um, there were many eastern principalities that kind of turned to, to be a bit on their own. Um, and, and these were, however, in fact much closer to the uh, Central Asia and probably also in here absorbing other further influences even after the say the end of the Mongol Empire as such. Um, so w what I'd like to stress is how slowly actually the Persian military traditions changed under the uh, the direct direct uh, Central Asian influence. And there were however certain changes that were evident uh, in this area of eastern Iran, as we were saying before, with this padded coats um, uh, used um, like the Kazagans or the Kaftans that um, seem to have fallen out of use uh, in favor of other form of equipment that uh, included now a, a much higher degree of lamellar armor. Um, the, uh, the horse armor actually had always existed at this point, but the um, it, it was the type of armor that was changing, in fact. And the reason for this substantial widening of the um, Eastern uh, Persian, uh, Eastern Iranian um, cavalry can, and, and, and also horse armor, can arguably have been caused by the injection of many uh, horse archers into to the local warfare, so that archery, horse archery, uh, necessarily brought to the necessity of having a a greater protection, especially for the horses that, as we've said, were these kind of um, easier targets. Now, for this, uh, I think it's all. There would be something also about the rest of Mongol technology, but is this? Uh, you know, this is not thing to strictly to do with with um, the heavy cavalry. So we will discuss about this in another on another occasion. So I would say for for today it's enough, um, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it and otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, um, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.